On STS-80, if you look here, what you're about to see, this is the, this is the Earth down here. You'll, the, one of the first things you'll see on the screen is a little pulsing object. It's actually quite big. It's, ar it's around that big. Moving over here, and then you'll see it change, actually change directions and go out into space. But that's not what we're looking for. In the middle of the screen, slowly, you'll see a very big kind of translucent ball with a hole in the middle, very similar to the rest of our UFOs, kind of streaking by and going into the distance. And slowly, 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 as it goes into the distance, you can see it getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So we were experiencing the depth of field of one of these large disks as it's moving past, way, way past the space shuttle and into the far distance. It basically reaches a point, and once it reaches this point of its destination, it stops moving, and then it becomes extra luminous. It starts to give off some extra light. And slowly what we start to see is a formation, an actual circular formation, kind of looking at an angle in, into this formation. We can see these objects that are slowly moving into position and then actually lighting up. Once they hit their positions, they're lighting up. This is suggesting incredible intelligence, something you wouldn't expect for space debris or space junk or some sort of natural phenomena. You certainly couldn't expect that meteorites or shooting stars could, could fly through space and then stop at a point and then all of a sudden give off this extra luminosity. The luminosity is constant once they start giving it off. As the camera starts to slowly go away and it's moving over the curvature of the Earth, we see more and more of these things coming into position. And then once they reach their positions, they light off. And then finally, we see another object kind of like this one coming in from the foreground and heading towards the center of the circle. It becomes very, very faint. You can barely see it on the screen as it's moving into position. And finally, when it gets into what appears to be the center of the circle, it literally just starts shining like a diamond and its light is luminous and continuous. This whole formation suggests amazing intelligence and amazing organization. Could this be something staged by NASA or could these actually be UFOs? We see two of our very familiar looking disc-shaped objects coming into position here and here on your video monitor. One comes in from one direction and one comes in from another direction. And then we hear a gopher wake shield. That's something that one of the people from Huntsville, Alabama say on the radio. And then they just literally, it's after we hear a gopher wake shield, they just literally bolt out into space and disappear in a matter of a second or two. Houston, for wake shield. So I researched what wake shield was because I thought, Maybe this had something to do with, a, again, a black ops test or some sort of a, of a test that NASA was doing out there. Wake Shield has nothing to do with these two things. Wake Shield is actually a satellite used for growing pure crystals in the wake of the satellite. When the satellite actually travels through space and it's moving, it actually produces a wake just like a boat does on a lake. And inside the wake, they grow very high quality crystals for you know, computer chips and semiconductors. So wake shield has literally nothing to do with the two objects you're seeing. The objects are probably unidentified flying objects or, or UFOs. Bertrand Russell. Edgar Mitchell, former astronaut who walked on the moon in 1971 during Apollo 14, has since become a major public advocate in the growing worldwide UFO movement. He speaks at UFO conventions all over the world. In a 1998 London Times News article, Mitchell is described as believing that aliens have landed on the Earth 
and he has intensified his campaign to persuade Washington to acknowledge life beyond our skies. Mitchell argues that life is almost certain to exist on any other planet with a supportive environment. Some physicists, he points out, now believe it is possible to actually travel faster than the speed of light. He is 90% certain that many of the thousands of UFOs recorded since the 1940s belong to visitors from another planet. Although some have been delusions and others natural phenomena, too many remain unexplained, he said. This suggests there are humanoids manning craft which have characteristics not in the arsenal of any nation on Earth that we know of. This is very alarming, he said. Edgar Mitchell holds a PhD from MIT and stands to be a perfect candidate in this particular NASA UFO investigation. Mitchell says his research, including conversations with people who have worked in intelligence agencies and military groups, have convinced him that the American government has covered up the truth about UFOs for 50 years. I thought if I sent um, Edgar Mitchell the, the tether footage from STS-75 that he could clearly see that we were looking at the largest UFOs ever captured on film. I wrote Apollo 14 astronaut Dr. Edgar Mitchell in October of 1999. On November 24, 1999, Edgar Mitchell wrote me the following letter. David Sarita, yes, I have received your film and reviewed it and the info package you provided. I see utterly nothing about the tethered incident that is particularly interesting. If there is more revealing footage, then I will look at it. However, I have looked at many feet of space film and have yet to see only one that has anything worth looking into regarding UFO appearances. Signed, Edgar Mitchell. I could not accept the idea that such a great proponent of UFOs was so adamantly against the suggestion that these giant circles passing behind the tethered satellite were UFOs. He was shrugging off the most astounding piece of video ever witnessed of UFOs in the history of the space program. I couldn't believe it. Dr. Mitchell, who was an MIT PhD, could not even acknowledge that the disks were clearly going behind the 12 mile length of the tether. He couldn't even see that very simple fact. I think just about any moron can tell the difference between when a disk is going behind this piece of wood and when it's going in front of it. That's in front, that is behind. This is not in front, this is behind. And that's exactly how they appear. Why couldn't Edgar Mitchell see this point? I decided to try to argue the points with Mitchell more precisely. He wrote me back almost immediately. David, at first glance they are just particles, perhaps outgassed. I do not know. But I certainly would look for a more prosaic explanation than UFOs. If you have a better film, I will look at it, but I am not very optimistic that they are anything exotic. Signed, Edgar Mitchell. Edgar Mitchell wrote to me that he thought the objects were just particles, perhaps outgassed from the from the space shuttle. How does a particle appear to be visible from over 77 miles away? We're looking, the cameras on the space shuttle are, are at least 77 miles away and drifting past 100 miles. How do you see just little particles of dust floating by that appear as perfect giant circles with notches cut out of the side, clearly passing behind the tether, pulsing with very sophisticated uh, wave patterns? How do particles behave like this? Uh, maybe I have to relearn and reinvestigate uh, particle theory to understand some of these ideas, these ridiculous ideas that some of these scientists are coming up with. He wrote me back the following letter on December 3rd, 1999. David Sarita, I remain open-minded, but I saw nothing on the tape you sent that had sharply defined edges in the vicinity of or passing behind the tether. Also in the footage of the tether, the commentator on the spacecraft is making a running commentary. For really anything of significance in space around the tether at that time, don't you think they would have been saying something about it? If they were as big as you say, they would have been visible to the naked eye and surely reported, not ignored as seems to be the case. You comment about no infrared images. Of course not. If nothing is there, how could there be an infrared image? Signed, Edgar Mitchell. The first point that Dr. Mitchell makes here 
is that I saw nothing on the tape that had sharply defined edges in the vicinity of or passing behind the tether reveals that he is ignoring just how defined the edges of these huge discs are and how sharply defined they are as they travel behind the very clear edges of the tether. More precisely about the tether, we remember the Huntsville, Alabama NASA operator asking the crew, and how wide uh, does that tether appear to be? We, we, it seems to resemble a, a much wider strand than we'd expect. Can you describe which way the, uh, the satellite is visible on that uh, strand? The 12 mile long tether cable was only a tenth of a centimeter in thickness and should not have been visible from over 77 miles away. There was no answer to why the, it appeared so thick because the shuttle astronauts did not know the answer then. But on Wednesday, February 28, 1996, of the NASA.